Admiral Allen, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. As we look at one of the most important outcomes of the Arctic Council Ministerial, mm -hmm. there'll be a signing of an international search and rescue agreement. How important is that agreement to the Arctic? Well, I think it's vitally important because, first of all, it demonstrates that we can act collectively among the nations that uh, have a presence in the Arctic to do things together. I think the mere precedent of agreeing to do something collectively is very, very important. And I've talked to a lot of government leaders around the world, a lot of heads of Coast Guard and military organization. Nobody disagrees about search and rescue. Excellent. Do you think, as is former commandant of the Coast Guard, does the United States have sufficient capabilities to to respond to a major search and rescue activity if it occurred in U.S. waters? Well, U.S. waters off the Arctic is going to be problematic because there are limited uh, facilities and capabilities in and around Point Barrow. Uh, the largest facility on the North Slope is at Dead Horse where all of the support activities for the offshore oil and gas exploration take place and it's also the terminus of the uh, Alaska pipeline. But as you move further to the west into the Chukchi Sea, uh, there are going to be significant issues about our ability to stage far north and operate from there just because of limited you know, capabilities in Point Barrow and the other places that are up there. Are you concerned about the uh, lack of icebreaker capacity that the US, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. government has? Are you concerned that we're not forward deployed uh, in the region to be of greater assistance should an event occur? Well, I'm very concerned about the icebreaker situation, but I think what you really have to talk about, what is the system that will accomplish the mission and achieve the effects you want? And it is, in my view, floating presence with ice strengthened vessels, which icebreakers are, is ability to forward deploy people, aircraft, and then the ability to do command and control and communications, and then operate with aviation assets. Now, icebreakers are part of that system, but in my view, a very fundamental part, because in the absence of the ability uh, to have infrastructure there that can support communications, you've got a floating platform where you can communicate from, land helicopters on, and birth at least a, a small number of people in a forward operating base should there be an event. If the United States doesn't possess these capabilities, would they have to look to other governments or to the private sector? Or who, who supplies these capabilities if the United States does not create that infrastructure? Well, if we have no icebreaking capability and there is a forward uh, demand for capability up there, we're going to have to partner and maybe we'll have to rely on these agreements. But uh, I think the optic of having a foreign country come to our rescue uh, because we have failed to take into account the requirements for ice strengthener icebreakers uh, a long time ago, and this issue's been floating around a long time, will really come back to haunt us. Absolutely. There's been a lot of discussion and, and forward movement of uh, oil companies looking at uh, exploring the uh, oil and gas resources in the Arctic. As the uh, National Incident Commander for the BP oil spill last year and your own extensive knowledge of the Arctic, what would a response look like or could there be an adequate response to an oil spill in Arctic waters? Uh, there can be an adequate response, but I think we need to understand the differences both in the uh, physical environment and, and how the oil will be extracted. Uh, the deep water horizon, the riser pipe went 5,000 feet to the seafloor and then they were drilling 12,000 feet additionally. In the Arctic, you're talking about several hundred to 500 feet and then uh, very much less uh, uh, depth. And the pressures involved are going to be probably a third we experience in the Gulf of Mexico. But I think the challenge up there are going to be the, uh, the seasonality, uh, whether you have ice, open water, or in the spring and the fall, whether you have a slushy amount of ice and oil being entrained in ice that is not fast yet and then freezes will be very, very problematic. So uh, what you need to do is deal with uh, uh, capabilities and recovery methods that allow you to be effective in ice. And frankly, uh, we're very limited when it comes to that. And probably the most effective response mechanism we would have should that occur would probably be an in-situ burn. There's a suggestion that the, the future work of the Arctic Council, they will form a task force to look at a, a framing an international agreement on oil, oil spill response. Would there be one thing you would want to see in that agreement should it come to pass? Well, I would just note we already have international treaties that require us to consult with other nations in the event there is a potential for an oil spill. In fact, we did that with Cuba. If there was a chance, the oil might become entrained in the uh, loop current during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So I think there is ample uh, authority out there right now to engage in these conversations. I think what the council can do is give more structure to that, more predictability, and create a framework by which we can do exercises, increase our preparedness, and know to a virtual certainty how we're going to respond, what equipment will be moved, and what we can expect of each other. Well, thank you very much, Admiral Allen, for your insights, uh, particularly as we look at uh, greater human and economic activity in the Arctic.
Thank you.